Well, this obviously is an enormous honor. I would like to thank uh, the Russ family. Uh, I'd like to thank Ohio University and certainly the National Academy of Engineering at, and the Russ Committee. One of the one of my real joys in science is I've been involved in a number of participated in a number of paradigm changes over my career, and I'll talk about two tonight. The first was uh, bringing engineering to biology. In 1970, when I went to Caltech as a young assistant professor, I decided I'd spend half my time uh, trying to develop technologies that would decipher biological information, DNA, RNA, proteins, and the like. And indeed, over the next 25 years or so, we developed a series of five instruments that really did just that. One of them, the automated DNA sequencer, led, frankly, uh, into the next paradigm change, uh, the Human Genome Project, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. What was instructive about developing the automated DNA sequencer was our initial failure. I'd started with a superb biologist that just didn't have the cross-disciplinary background that was required. And in fact, it was Lloyd Smith who brought chemistry, my Kunkapiller, who brought engineering, and Tim Hunkapiller, Mike's brother, who brought computer science to a focus on automated DNA sequencing. And within six weeks of the time I'd put that team together, we developed the concept, and three years later, we had developed the first uh, prototype instrument. I was unusually fortunate to be able to contribute to the Human Genome Project, that is, deciphering the uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes in each and every one of your cells by determining the order of the DNA letters in them in several ways. One, I, I, my team developed the automated DNA sequencer. Two, I was an early advocate in 1985 for the project when 95% of the biologists were opposed, and in fact, the National Institutes of Health was most opposed to this project. I was on the committee uh, in 88-89 that made the definitive decision that the Genome Project should go forward, and then finally I directed a center, one of 16 in the states, uh, that sequenced much of chromosomes 14 and 15. I think what is really remarkable about the Human Genome Project is it demonstrates explicitly the power of how technology can drive biology. What did the Genome Project do for us? And, and in part, thinking about this came from uh, reading the New York Times magazine by Nicholas Wade, uh, New York Times article by Nicholas Wade on how the Genome Project had failed. And I think it's anything but a failure. So number one, it democratized genes. It made all genes accessible to all biologists. Uh, number two, it defined for the first time all genes, and by inference, all proteins, and it enabled this new science that we're developing now called systems biology, which takes a holistic approach to dealing with biological complexity. Number three, it catalyzed the development of high-throughput instrumentation, uh, very high processing of information in biology, in genomics, in proteomics, the study of proteins, in metabolomics, the study of molecules, and so forth. Number four, it did exactly the same in computer science. In fact, it was the Genome Project that legitimately brought in mathematicians and computer scientists and even theoretical physicists to think about acquiring and storing, uh, analyzing, mining, integrating, and ultimately creating predictive and actionable models of biology. But it did even more. It was the first biological project whose policy was open source for all data, instantaneous release of data to the biological community so everyone could analyze this new information. It was the first that really said we have to have standards for data quality, obviously a critical point. It transformed biology in many ways. It gave us access to the genomes of plants, of animals, of microbes, and 
those genomes have transformed many fields of biology, and it transformed our understanding of evolution in absolutely uh, magnificent ways. It did the same for medicine. It created a whole new field of diagnostics, biomarkers that can actually interrogate early diagnosis, can stratify complex diseases into their different types so you can do an impedance match against appropriate thera therapies uh, and the like. It has also opened up the possibility of using DNA sequencing uh, to identify genes that have actionable behaviors with regard to patients. Leiden factor five, a tendency toward blood clotting, can be marvelously dealt with if the patient knows they shouldn't sit on an airplane for five hours without drinking and getting up to exercise and so forth. And of course, even more interesting, now we're sequencing tumors, we're now sequencing cancers, and looking at disease perturbed networks and figuring out from those exactly the right drug uh, for the patient. And a fourth area that I'll talk about in just a moment is this thing we've called P4 medicine, and I'll return to that. But let me say, finally, what the Genome Project did was it, in many interesting ways, changed the sociology of biology. Number one, it really introduced this concept of big science and by big science, I mean cross-disciplinary, integrated, hypothesis-driven science that tacks very hard problems, as opposed to small science, something that's done by a single investigator and a few uh, individuals. And the synergy between these two is absolutely enormous, and that's a shame because uh, in NIH today, there's an enormous uh, desire to do away with big science, which would be a tragic mistake, and focus entirely on small science. We need, a, obviously, a mixed portfolio. The Genome Project also was the first that really got into the social, the ethics, the legal uh, aspects of biology in a, a way that presuaged how we're really going to have to think about uh, medicines of the future. So these all transform biology, but perhaps in no, no way was the transformation greater than the transformation that occurred uh, in the area of medicine. And it's what we call P4 medicine, a predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. And the idea of P4 medicine is that medicine has legitimately become an informational science. And my vision of the future, when your genome will cost a few hundred dollars to complete, is that in 10 years or so, each and every one of us will be surrounded by a virtual cloud of billions of data points, and we will have the computational tools to reduce that enormous data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about health and disease. Indeed, what P4 medicine is all about is just two things. One, demystifying the complexities of disease, and two, creating metrics for wellness so we can assess for each individual their wellness state and optimize for the future their wellness. And indeed, I forecast a whole new wellness industry will occur that in time will far surpass uh, the disease industry, the healthcare industry of today. So in closing, let me uh, thank one more person, my wife, Valerie uh, Logan. She's here tonight, and uh, what I think I've been most fortunate in doing uh, at ISB, together with my uh, colleagues uh, Dave Gallus and Diane Isanaku, who are here tonight, is setting up strategic partnerships. And I have to say, of all the successful strategic partnerships I've ever set up, the one with Valerie Logan was the best. Thank you. Thank you.